Hello YouTube, I'm back. I'm here at Dead Woman's Ditch, the legendary location on the Quantock Hills in Somerset, which was the focus for a previous video I did on the brutal murder of Jane Shawnee at the hands of her lover, John Walford, and the ghostly tales that were associated with it. Well, you'll be pleased to know that since I posted that video on social media, I've had a plethora of messages and I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you to yours as well, they do mean a lot. But one that stood out in particular was this one. It reads, Hi Luke, thank you for your great video you made on John Walford and Jane Shawnee. I love the descriptions that you gave of them both. And even now, I get free drinks in the pubs in Stowey, which is just down there, because I am related to John Walford. And so is my mum, my sister, and my aunt. I mean, what a remarkable message to have from someone out of the blue. That is the power of social media right there, isn't it? So I couldn't pass this opportunity up. I had to speak to one of these people that is related to John Walford. Not the best person in this story to be related to, but nonetheless, she's called Penny Bernard and she is a historian. She doesn't live here in Somerset, but I have been chatting to her about every single thing there is to know about the story that happened between John Walford and Jane Shawnee here on the Quantock Hills. Enjoy. I'm definitely not a descendant, um, but I am descended from his brother. So uh, we're, we're relatives, but distant relatives, but enough to use to scare potential boyfriends. My parents always used to say that uh, we had a murderer in the family whenever I brought a boyfriend home um, in order to scare them off. Um, and it didn't work with my husband, so obviously not that scary. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you find out that John Walford was in the family? Quite early on, actually. Um, so my grandmother was an amazing woman. She was Molly Walford, um, became butcher. And she was the family storyteller. And it, she sort of she felt it was her duty to try and remember all the different stories. So we used to go down and visit her a lot on the Quantocks when we were little. And everywhere we went, there was a story attached to some particular landmark or other. And of course, you can't really go around the Quantox without coming across sort of Dedham's Ditch and um, John Walford at some point. So I must have known from a very, very early age. And it became a bit of an obsession of mine when I was a teenager. When I was about 13, 14, and we were having a long holiday on the Quantox and um, staying near the place where he'd had his last drink and this, that and the other and going for long walks where he was hanged. And it, I sort of decided I was going to throw myself into it because this was the days before the internet and there'd been a very good book published um, by David Worthy which was called The Quantock Tragedy which you can still get on Kindle. He was an excellent local historian who died recently and he used the trial transcripts and all sorts of things like the, the newspaper reports of the day, Tom Paul's details. So I read that and I sort of got into it and we had um, of lots of long talks um, with my grandma who was the repository of all knowledge and did extra research and that and so yeah I, I did kind of in my head I wanted to straighten out the story and strip it back from this romantic tragedy to find out really what happened because at the end of the day it unsettled me that it was a romantic tragedy about a young woman who was heavily pregnant being murdered and I, in my head that just sat very wrong. What was the reputation like I mean I suppose given what John Walford was charged and hung hanged for mm -hmm. I guess the reputation back then was not good well I know that up until my grandma's generation if somebody asked a member of my family if they were related to the John Walford they would deny it and they would say nope nothing to do with us different family and it's very noticeable. I've been recently doing the family tree um, up until John Walford. There's loads of John Walfords in the family. Pretty much every generation has at least one or two. And then John Walford comes along and is hanged. And that's when people stop being called John Walford in our family. And it's very much the, a conscious attempt to distance themselves from it, I think. And certainly grandma used to say to me that um, her grandparents were still alive when I think one of John Walford's children, Betty, was still alive. She would have been a very, very elderly lady and they would go out of their way to avoid her. And, and you know, the, she was very much shunned in the village. There, there was still a glamour to him though. So, so I think they were ashamed of, about the murder 
And that was obviously an awful thing to happen. But there was always a glamour. And I remember when we were being told the story when I was little, it was poor John Walford. Oh, isn't it terrible? A bit like um, the sort of, so Tom Poole um, told the story to Coleridge and Wordsworth shortly after um, John was hanged. And it, there was very much the sense that John was a very popular man and everybody liked him. Nobody really liked his wife. And oh, poor John, you know, what a tragedy that he was married to this awful woman. And, you know, and so there was a bit of a romance and a glamour about him, which looking about, back at it now makes me feel quite sick, actually, having done more research on the, the details of the murder and the characters involved. Um, but it was very much John was sort of this heroic, romantic figure, good looking, dashing, you know, all these possibilities that he could have been. I know Wordsworth in particular um, was fascinated by the idea of what he would have been had he had access to an education and hadn't just been a humble charcoal burner. Um, you know, so there was a whole sort of romantic notion about um, unfulfilled potential and the noble savage. I mean, a couple of questions that... Mm. I had crop up on my previous video was firstly what happened to Anne Rice because she was John's want for better word true love um or so certain stories go do you know what happened to her yeah so she gave birth to a little girl she went to go and live in Stigersey according to the census records in um Gosh, so she gave birth to a little girl and three months later she died, um, which is, yeah, I I feel desperately sorry for her. I mean, there's there's this whole ghastly description in um, various different sources about how on the day of the execution, she's at the back of the crowd that goes to witness John being hanged and he calls for her and she's dragged to the front. She's practically insensible. She's fainting. She can't speak. She's so overcome with emotion. And he sits in the back of the wagon with her for some time talking with their heads bent together. And then he goes to kiss her. And uh, one of the jailers says, look, there's no good in you trying to do that. And she's pulled away and he grabs at her hand and kisses her hand and, um, and then stands up and, and they blindfold him and he takes his great leap from the, the back of the cart and dies. But um, it must have been an awful thing to go through for her because she'd been pretty convinced that she was going to marry him to the point where she was living at his mother's home, which was how she ended up getting pregnant, presumably. Um, I mean, it sounds like John was extremely charming and good looking and very persuasive with the women. So she was, you know, pretty set on marriage. It was all going to be happening. And then all of this turns up and she's left stranded, pregnant, alone and shamed. And uh, with everybody in the county knowing what she's gotten up to, uh, it must have been absolutely awful for her. Very traumatic. Um, so I'm not surprised she dropped dead three, three months after the baby that was brought up. Gosh, you know, I feel I feel a certain sense of overwhelming sympathy now more for Anne than anyone else, I think, in this tale. That's that's awful. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, the, the women in it, I just feel desperately, desperately sad for both of them. Um, Yes, uh, and poor Anne, you know, it must have been absolutely dreadful for her. Mm, absolutely. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you was about the location mm. of Jane's body, because I know that has been disputed over many years and told differently in many different tales. And given the fact that Dead Woman's Ditch sort of goes hand in hand with this story, we know that Dead Woman's Ditch was named prior to these events of John Walford and Jane Shawnee, that's a common misconception that it is how it got its name, but it's not. So a couple of people have said to me that Jane's body wasn't found in Dead Woman's Ditch. Is that right? No, there's this. It sounds like the murder took place over quite a few locations. So he sends her out around about 11 o'clock at night from the witness testimonies. Uh, he walks off with her to go and get some cider from the Castle of Comfort and they never make it because she's never seen at the Castle of Comfort. Um, at some point uh, during the walk over, he loses his rag with her and picks up a fence post um, and he starts hitting around the head with it. And we've, we've got pretty good testimony from the trial. They even were able to match up where the fence post came from because the fence post is found near her body covered in blood and they're able to say well look you know it slots back into this particular place where there's a fence post missing 
it must have happened there. So the general consensus is that that happened somewhere in Lucky Ike's Lane, which of course is not so lucky for Jane. Um, and then he had this brilliant idea apparently that he was going to throw her body down a copper mine. And there were quite a few that sort of pitted the hills at that point. And um, bearing in mind, this is 11 o'clock at night. It's, you know, it's gonna be dark. It's gonna be a bit confusing. She's very heavy because she's due any day now. And um, he apparently gets fed up with dragging her around. And then he has a pocket knife um, that he keeps on his body and he just decides he's going to slit her throat. And he just leaves her there. Um, but he takes the shilling that he had given her for the, um, for the cider and puts it back in his pocket and his pen knife. Um, and that's one of the things that condemns him in the end, because he says, oh, she's been robbed. And he tries to pass it off on, on somebody mugging her and that. And then they go and find the shilling in his pocket. And it's like, mm, really? So, yeah. So we don't know precisely where it was, but the, the, the legend I was told, and I think it stands up to scrutiny, is that um, he was hanged where her body was found because um, a lot of times in the old days to sort of really underline the fact that um, that this was a terrible crime if the person was being hanged they would hang them in the spot if possible where the crime was committed um, so that that would make sense of why his his body is hung um, at Wolfers gibbet as we now know it do you have any questions yourself about what happened all those years ago that are still yet to be answered? Um, I'd love to know what happened to Jane Shawnee because she's described in a lot of the literature as a poor, stupid creature, almost an idiot. Or uh, I think one of the quotes was her face was her face bespoke a weak and witless soul. So to me, it screams that Jane was a very vulnerable creature. And I think, yeah, I, 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 I think that's something that's not really been examined properly. Um, she's always sort of a very secondary character in this. John is the main star, Anne Rice is the tragic romantic heroine. And then Jane Shaw is kind of this bundled off as this lump and this embarrassment. Um, and from reading the descriptions of her, yeah, I'm wondering, did she have a learning disability? She certainly sounds a very vulnerable person. You know, the, John gets her pregnant twice. John's brother gets her pregnant once. So that's three kids out of wedlock. And there's lots of quotes throughout the thing that, uh, throughout the court transcripts and, and witness testimonies that, that make me think that she was a very, very vulnerable character. So she's terrified of going back to him. She doesn't want to go back to him. She doesn't know how to cook his dinner, um, which is unusual. Her mother makes a deal with John after the wedding that if John gives her some money, she will look after the children and Jane during the day. Jane just has to go back to sleep at his at night. Um, and that, that sort of, yeah, there, there's so many questions I have about Jane. I want to know her better and I feel desperately sorry for her because she strikes me as a very pathetic and vulnerable person creature and I just yeah I'm just very sad that she's been neglected so much in this story and then turned into this ghost that that people claim to see of her swearing and and being appalling and obnoxious and horrible up at the Dead and Stitch and yeah I kind of in in my head I really would like to look after her a bit better and do her memory a bit bit more justice so I feel like it's towards her memory that you sh show more empathy than John Walford, I guess? Absolutely. I think he was, um, I think he was a, an appalling person. Um, you know, he complains about, oh, I've got her pregnant again. She's going to be the end of me. Well, John, if you're as intelligent and as handsome as everybody says you are, surely you know how babies are made. Surely you know how to sort of, you know, stop that happening. So, you know, it, it, I have no sympathy towards him at all, really. I mean, I do to a certain extent, because being a charcoal burner was a really difficult task. You, you're working up on the hills six days a week. Uh, it's cold. It's hard work. You can't sleep for more than an hour at a time because you're tending the charcoal and making sure that that's burning properly. 
and not getting out of control. So, I mean, that's a horrendous lifestyle for anybody. But on the other hand, you've got this poor girl pregnant twice and you've got Nan Rice pregnant. You clearly know how it works. How are you complaining that you've gotten into this situation? He tries to run off at one point to London and, you know, he's about to sell everything and abandon them. So he doesn't take responsibility for his actions at all. And he lies through his teeth when they catch him. He's not particularly good at the murder either. They come, you know, they catch him, he's got blood spots on him because he's not managed to wash it properly. His best hiding places are up the chimney and in the thatch of the cottage. You know, he just strikes me as utterly feckless. Whereas, um, yeah, Anne and Jane, I, I feel really sorry for. Um, but I guess to- back then, the crowds, I guess, would have sided with John Walford, given the reputation of Jane. Probably, yes. They weren't a very sympathetic lot back then to anybody who was different. And he was tall and good looking and dashing and good fun and apparently a great laugh at the pub and everything else. Whereas, you know, Jane was a burden on the community. And um, I think they were sympathetic to Anne um, and because she came from a very good family and was, in fact, marrying beneath her to marry John. Um, so I think they were very sympathetic to her. But, yeah, Jane's just this embarrassment this drain on the public resources because she keeps getting pregnant and i don't know part of me thinks she must have been very vulnerable because they say that it happens because she's going up collecting wood it's her and her single mother on their own and she's going up collecting wood on the hills and she keeps getting pregnant well that just strikes me as you know poor girl it's a very vulnerable thing to be up on your own in those woods and not got anybody to protect you or look after you and socially you know the two of them are a very vulnerable group anyway her and her mother um i to be honest i always rather thought she was taken advantage of which is a polite way of saying it so um, Mm. the women don't come off very well in this story do they from history as time has told the story (laughs) but actually i feel like now might be the right time to actually try and get get the not the story changed as it were because you can't change stories as it were that well that easily but i feel like the onus is almost on us now to sort of see the story in a different light yeah i think it is actually i think it's time to revisit it and and to look at the female characters more because i mean everything is was written by a male perspective from a male perspective so and at the time you know 18th century men weren't renowned for being particularly you know, friendly to the opposite sex. I mean, the, the way they talk about John's mother as well is pretty horrendous. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's a good time now to, to look at it and sort of strip it back of the glamour and the romance that people like Holridge and Wordsworth and Paul infused it with and go, actually, who were the real characters behind it? What do we know of them? And, and what, you know, what can we take from that? Mm, absolutely. On another note, do you get to the Quantox much? Uh, not as much as I'd love to. It's still home in my head. Um, wherever we went in the world, uh, my family travelled a lot um, when I was growing up. But wherever we went in the world, the Quantox was always home. And it always will be in my heart. So, um, yeah. I think your sister even said that uh, whenever she goes to a pub or something, she gets a yeah. free drink because of her association to the story. Oh, honestly, the family have traded on it for years. And we've, we've got oh, my cousin called me from Australia when she heard we were doing this, went, oh, you must tell her about the time I was at Walford's gibbet and your, your grandma was telling us this story. And it was a beautiful day. And then all of a sudden this storm blew in out of nowhere. And I was convinced it was John Walford's ghost. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a massive part of our family history. My mother gets irritated by it, no end. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's a huge part of our family history. And weirdly, um, when my parents moved down to Nether Surrey a couple of years ago, they ended up buying the pub where he had his last drink, which wasn't deliberate. It was an accident. And we they were sitting in the garden and they, there was an old stone that had been carved. And it said, on this spot, John Walford had his last drink. But it was so faded that you couldn't see it unless the sun was angling in at a particular slant. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of, it's a big part of our family history and they were convinced there was a ghost in the house and it was, it was nicknamed John after John Walford. And um, yeah, so I mean, there's all sorts of silly things, but it's, it's definitely a massive part of our family identity. 
And the final question I wanted to ask, because your sister also tasked me to ask you about, uh, there's something to do with EastEnders. Oh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, that the, uh, the Walfords, uh, sorry, Walford is an area in EastEnders. Yeah. Um, so my grandma was a nurse. And many years ago, another cousin of hers who was um, from the Somerset side of the family, he was uh, one of the original writers of EastEnders. And he had called it Walford um, after the family. And uh, anyway, she had annoyed him because he'd previously written um, a TV series about nurses. And she picked him up and, and said, you know, you mustn't objectify these women. I, I, that's not the word she would have used, but effectively that's what he was doing. All the nurses were sexy totty. And grandma said, no, you shouldn't do this. They're hardworking professionals and it's demeaning. Um, so he deliberately put in characters to annoy her. So the Butcher family were named after my grandma. And so you had, um, I think, Mo, who had a little dog, Bobby. So Mo was my grandma, Molly, and Bobby was her husband, Bob. And he used to put in little things in EastEnders in very early days, deliberately to annoy my grandma and basically just sort of put her down and put her in her place because they didn't get on very well. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, my mind's blown. <laughs> it's a bit of a jump, isn't it, from the Walford murder to Walford's in uh, EastEnders? But, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's incredible. What a way to end. Thank you so much for that, Thank Penny. Thank you. It's been really, really fun.